If you're watching live, do like and subscribe. If you're listening to the podcast, do subscribe, leave us a cheeky five-star review. I am very, very honoured to be joined by Steve Turner of Unite, a seasoned trade unionist and, of course, candidate to be the next General Secretary of Unite Trade Union. I'm a member uh, myself of Unite, have been ever since it was founded via, via merger of its predecessors, Amicus and the TNG. Steve, big honour to have you. Hello, hello, hello. An honour to be with you. And so what we'll do, just to kick off, just so people know, there is a big, big, big General Secretary election yeah. in Unite, which is the biggest private sector union in the country and has been at the absolute uh, centre of many of the great trade union struggles, been at the absolute forefront of organising workers who have been pummeled over the last few years because of uh, the Tory government's policies and suffered as key workers during COVID-19 um, yeah. and, of course, plays a key role within the Labour Party. And uh, Len McCluskey, for those who don't, I'm sure everyone does know, has been someone who has played a formidable role in all of that in the direction in terms of the Labour Party, in terms of union organising and a lot of grassroots struggles outside of the formal Labour movement. Um, and now there are four candidates standing. Uh, three of them are on the left. One of them is on the right, Gerard Coyne, who is a, a somebody who very much wants the Labour Party to be on the right and would leave Unite a toothless union. I'm, I'm just saying as it is, people know I'm, I say, uh, I, can, I'm, I, I express my opinions. I don't pretend uh, uh, to be a, 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 a news, an impartial news reporter. I'm, of course, an opinion writer. So that's, that's where things stand. And this is an existential election because if Gerard Coyne wins and it is a first past the supposed uh, system to determine the next General Secretary of Unite, that will mean a dramatic shift in the direction of Unite and the Labour Party. Steve, you just spell, spell it out. What's at stake here? Because three left wing candidates, three candidates on the left, one right wing candidate in unison, the two left wing candidates had a majority. They lost because they split the vote. And that's going to happen in Unite now, as as things stand, because now you topped the nominations. You came by far ahead of the nominations and won the biggest branches. But the other two candidates, they're not going anywhere. So just tell us, if what's the stakes in this election? Well, you, you could be sitting here <laughs> where I'm sitting right now, Owen, and you've just laid it out. At absolutely crystal clear. The stakes couldn't be higher, not just for my union. And I'm an incredibly proud 39-year member uh, of my union and the left in our union, uh, but for our wider movement as well. Uh, and not just the Labour Party, but our trade union movement and all of those alliances that, as you just very eloquently outlined, we've nurtured and we've built and we've confided in and, and have been at the forefront of so many of the struggles against attacks on working class communities, our members at work, and boistering up employers that in the most opportunistic way want to attack working people over the course of the last 10 years. Since Unite first came together in 2007, um, I'm incredibly proud to be part of that leadership team that's seen us, not just Unite, a number of different unions that came together in, in terms of the Unite merger, but has seen us position ourselves at the forefront of our movement. We are the union here in the UK and indeed internationally in many circles that people look to, that are inspired by, that are motivated by, that draw their energy and their confidence from when it comes to leading the big political and industrial struggles of our time. And Len's been a fantastic General Secretary in positioning us and bringing us together, uniting our union in order to do that. It's not just about a General Secretary, of course it's not. This is about uh, the leadership taking our union in a completely different direction over the course of the forthcoming five, 10, maybe 15 years that would destroy the alliances that we've built, that would recapture for the right the politics of our union and its influence within our wider movement, but that would also undermine that the energy in our union right now that defends our, our members, the 70 you know, pound a day that we pay to members on strike from a 45 million pound strike fund, the fantastic organising and leverage strategies that we roll out, the energy that we put into supporting our shop stewards movement that would be one of the first targets in a right wing coup uh, in our union. I've been here before. I've worked under right wing general secretaries. I've seen the impact that they have on the rollout of stewards education, the building of combines, 
the ability of shop stewards to come together and build an alliance across big corporations to build the power that we need in order to fight back against global corporations very often in our union. And all of that, all of that is under threat right now in this election. Now, if I was to go on Twitter.com, fantastic website full of so much insight, scintillating analysis, um, or not, yeah. I, I would, I, I would, I would read, and I have read that you are the right wing. You are a right wing candidate. Now you're the chair of the People's Assembly, yeah. <laughs> People's Assembly Against Austerity. I've been at several anti austerity marches with you over many, many years. Can you just explain to people who? maybe have seen these these wild, wild posts, just how absurd that is based on your politics. Just explain your politics, explain your political record uh, to explain just how absurd the idea that you are in I, any sense right wing. I find it, I read some of this, um, some of this as well. I mean, it just astonishes me that people can write this stuff who have no knowledge of my background who don't know me who wouldn't know me if they walked down the street uh, by the way and if they've been involved in politics themselves would know how absurd uh, some of the statements that they write uh, are you know you, you laid it out just there in terms of not just what i've done in my union but what i've done outside of my union you know i've been very proud to have built links with organisations that have been at the forefront of supporting working people and their families and their wider communities in the fight against austerity for 10 years. When we formed the People's Assembly Against Austerity, I was incredibly proud to have been placed in the co-chair's position, and I've been the co-chair ever since, from the first day when we launched it at a press conference uh, in central London. And I'm going to make a plug for the demonstration on the 26th of June. Right now, if there's a, you know, whatever your rationale for wanting to get out and fight the Tories right now, fight for a cleaner, greener society, to fight fire and rehire, to fight for decent homes and a million new council houses, whatever it is to defend our NHS against privatisation uh, or our services against further outsourcing, to give a pay rise to people that deserve a pay rise. You know, whatever that motivation is, get out on the streets on the 26th of June and join the People's Assembly demonstration. But I've been at the forefront of our, my background was very active in militant, actually, during the 1980s. And I don't hide that. I don't hide that. I fell out with militant when um, the leadership of militant took it away from the Labour Party. I always saw the home of the left being in the Labour Party. If you're going to persuade working class people, my members that I meet day in, day out in factories and offices, and workplaces across our nations that you know there, there is hope and an opportunity to transform our society to address the very real concerns and legitimate issues they've got it's going to be the labor party that was my belief and therefore the home of the left was inside the labor party and not running off and forming what's now quite an obscure uh, second party outside and i stayed in the labor party and i've stayed in the labor party all the way through that period and we've We've been in difficult positions before. We're in a difficult position now, but we've been in difficult positions before. I remember the Blair years. I remember the Neil Kinnock years of the 1980s and the expulsion of many good friends of mine uh, from the Labour Party. I was suspended myself. My whole constituency Labour Party in Bermondsey in South East London was, was uh, suspended. But we fought through that and we rebuilt and we took our, unit, our, our movement on a journey. And eventually that journey led us to the position where Jeremy Corbyn became a leader. And we were inspired again and we started to develop our policies that add meaning to ordinary working class people at work, but their friends and their families in their communities, because we were talking to people about genuine issues that were impacted. And we had a plan and we gave people hope and a vision and we had a deliverable program. And I take me out off to Jeremy, given the attacks that he faced right through his both internally from the party, of course, the apparatchiks and the right wing in the party, but externally in the press and in our communities where he was ridiculed and completely under, but destroyed really. And a weaker individual would have been destroyed, mentally would have been destroyed by that. Uh, and I was proud to be part of that. And that team with John McDonald developing that alternative economic strategy, the fight against austerity, that we, we in that wider movement that the People's Assembly Against Austerity represented. And it's a really broad movement that's what kept the anti-austerity message alive until we got to the point where Jeremy could be elected as leader of the Labour Party. And that's why, you know, it's so, this election is so important 
this isn't just an election about Unite and who's going to be the General Secretary of Unite. As important as that is with 1.1 million working people who, who depend on their union to deal with very real issues for them at work and to improve their lives, this is an issue for our movement. This is an issue for our party, absolutely, but it's also an, an issue for every one of us in our communities that wants to see those alliances being built and nurtured to defeat a Tory government right now that's hell-bent with an 80-seat majority on attacking working people. I know that there's, the soundbite's great from Johnson. The reality on the ground, very, very different. If we think that they're going to end fire and rehire, if we think that they're not going to force working class people to pay the price of yet another crisis, not of our making, as they did with the financial crash in 2008. If we think that they're not going to privatise our National Health Service, if we're deluded enough to, they, to think that they're going to end the housing crisis by building the million new council homes that we need in order to put a safe and secure, affordable roof over people's heads to end overcrowding. If we think that they're going to stop eviction, dream on, dream on. The only people that are going to do that is us. And we're going to do that collectively. We're going to do it for our unions, building class consciousness and a movement. But we're going to do it outside of our unions. We have to do that. Unite's not big enough to do that. We need to build an alliance across our trade union movement, of course. But a bigger alliance than that to shift the centre ground of politics. And we have to take that narrative into our... We have to win the battle of ideas in our party, of course, and in our community, but in our unions as well. And that's a huge challenge. We've got many challenges in front of us, not just the recovery from COVID, uh, the fallout from Brexit and everything that goes with all of that. We understand that. But we've also got climate change on the horizon. Our economy is going to change exponentially. We've got automation and artificial intelligence. We've got that whole digitalization of work on the horizon. You know, these are huge challenges for us but also opportunities, opportunities for working people to shape the future of work and therefore their lives. To talk meaningfully about shorter working time, a 20 hour week, full employment, hope and opportunities for our kids and our grandchildren and the kids that we've not even thought of yet, that won't be born for 30 years. You know, I've always said that. Now, now is our time to grasp the opportunities that that gives us. But they're only opportunities unless we choose to take them. And if we're going to do that, we have to inspire and we have to motivate and we have to have a vision and a plan and talk to people, get ourselves in front of people, win that narrative and the battle of ideas. And if we can do that, nothing is impossible. Everything is possible if working class people and our communities are confident. That's what's at stake here. It's much, much bigger than, just, for me anyway, it's much, much bigger than being General Secretary of Unite. I'm very proud to be a candidate here. And I'm, I'm a, absolutely, I'm confident that, you know, we'll take our union on the next stage of its journey. But I'm really engaged and excited about all of those challenges that we face as a movement and as a society. I'm, I want to see, you know, I want to see as much emphasis on our members having a safe roof, safe, secure roof over their heads as I do a decent wage at work. You know, I don't leave my trade unionism at the factory gate or the office door. It comes back into our communities. We all live in our communities. I want to see local services. I want to see investment in the NHS. I want to see kids going into decent schools, well-funded, with reduced class sizes. I want to see the millions of new green jobs we can create in our public services, re retracting back from you know, the years, the decade and more of austerity politics and cuts and outsourcing and the rest of it. I want to see us investing in local services, not just to get us back to where we were, but to provide the services that we rightly demand now. I want that care service. I want reduced class sizes. I want a health service we can be rightly proud of now, of course, but I want it invested in and I want it in public hands. And I want public transport delivering for us publicly as a service, not as a means of maximising profit for private corporations. So I want all of that. And that's as important to me in the public sphere as it is, you know, winning the demands that we rightly place on employers in an industrial world. Yeah. These are not, these are two parallel traits for trade unions. They're not polar opposites. Under your leadership, what would Unite do in terms of the Labour Party uh, when it comes to policies that 
a lot of people are very passionate about public ownership, taxing the rich and big business, uh, investment, not austerity, green industrial revolution. Yeah. But as well as that, and, and I'm, I am going to ask you about organizing as well, because as you, you know, it's important to note, this is not a Labour Party internal election. It's a trade union election um, with lots of people voting in it who aren't members of the Labour Party or even vote for the Labour Party. But in terms of the Labour Party, because the Labour Party, of course, was founded by the trade unions 120 years ago to provide political representation for working people. So what, is, what, what would you do in terms of fighting for those policies? And as well as that, attempts to shut down democracy within the Labour Party because the suggestions the leadership rules could be changed to stop any left winger ever getting on the ballot ever again, uh, yeah. shut down internal democracy, uh, in terms of getting people selected, not least working class candidates who support the policies I've just mentioned, what would your position be if you were General Secretary of Unite on those things? Well, I thought all, all of the the approach that's being made now by Keir Starmer and those around Keir Starmer is completely alien to where we need to be as a movement right now. It's no accident that a lack of clarity on any policy or vision that was attractive to working class people and others, actually, wider society in the last election uh, was very, very clear in those local election uh, in the, the, you know, the selection now at Batley and Spain, all of these uh, all of these are creating very real problems for us now in our party. The fact that we're concentrating more on navel gazing and attacking the left in our party than we are in outlining a very clear and positive vision to motivate and inspire people to come home to Labour or indeed to vote to Labour for the, for the first time, maybe even to stay with Labour. This is a huge challenge for us now. And I, I don't know what Keir's politics are. I don't think that Keir knows what his politics are right now to be honest with you. Uh, I know what our challenge is. Our challenge is to take him on that journey to recognise that the only way that Labour will be successful, the only way that we'll win collectively together is when we stand together. And we can't do that in a divided party. People don't vote for a divided party. So he needs to step back. The party needs to step back and recognise where that broad church that actually during Jeremy's years, we very much were, even though that the, the opposite, the polar opposite to where we were politically was attacking Jeremy constantly. Well, the left has never done that. The left lived through the Blair years. We didn't we didn't go on the attack against uh, Tony Blair. Some would argue that we should have done. We didn't or we should have done more. We didn't because at the end of the day, we're proud to have seen a Labour government that was delivering for working people. I'm doing everything that we wanted to do but it was delivering for working people. So I want to see a Labour go. I want to see Labour councils because I think they make a difference for ordinary working people. People that are watching this that are struggling at home right now or got kids living at home because they can't afford a home or that are struggling in precarious work on minimum wage or a shortage of hours or being forced to work at home over the last year and are now being told, well, actually, your home is now going to become your permanent workplace. And they're sitting on their bed thinking, well, how's this going to work? You know, I want our party to have a vision that is attractive to those people, that addresses the very real concerns that they've got, that shares our values. Now, that to me is socialism. <laughs> I'm a socialist, right? My socialism, though, my politics comes from my life experiences. I've been unemployed. I've, I've walked miles to get, a, to get a job, and they've not even turned up to give you an interview at the end, but I turn around and walk miles back again. I've stood outside pubs on the old Kent Road waiting for a van to come along at six o'clock in the morning to get a day's work in construction because I ain't had any money and that and I have an empathy with people that are in that position now and many people are in that exact same position now and I want us to address it some of what we do well we'll address things industrially of course we will in our traditional ways we'll build our movement and the confidence of our reps and we'll train and we'll educate and we'll inspire and we'll resource and if people want to fight bad employers we'll make sure they're not starved back to work for our strike fund and we'll do all of that. Of course, we'll do all of that. But many of the challenges that we've got are political challenges. And people look, will look to Labour for answers. And at the moment, that we're not getting those answers. And that's the problem that we've got. And so I, I'm, I'm very happy to sit down with Keir tomorrow to talk to try and get him into a place, a better place than he's in right now. We need to stop the witch hunts. We need to stop the silencing of democracy and the closing down of debate in our CLPs up and down our countries. We need to stop the threats that you'll be suspended if you raise a question or an issue 
in a CLP and we need to reinstate all those that have been suspended for raising those questions. We're an open party. We're a broad party. And we can't say that either and then keep attacking others as if they're our enemy when the real enemy is sitting the other side of Parliament uh, in the form of Boris Johnson and a, you know, a group of multimillionaires sitting in the cabinet trying to destroy everything that we built and we value so much. So we've got to take the Labour Party on a journey as well. But we've, we've got a political strategy as a union and we've engaged with our work, uh, our members in workplaces to get them more involved in politics locally as well as nationally. And we found our voice inside our party. And we've got to continue to do that. I want our party to look and to sound and to share the values of the people that I represent. And therefore, we've got to get, get our people in a place where they're comfortable and confident enough to want to be part of that and take positions in that and to stand up with a confidence in those local meetings as well as those big national meetings and argue the case. Argue the case. And I think we can win that. We've got policies. We've got a fantastic manifesto from 2017, 2019. Nobody's ripping that up. We're not ripping that. I'm sitting down with Andy McDonald right now in a power in the workplace task group to think about how we build on the program of employment rights and trade union rights that we developed in the manifesto for 2019. And that's about picking up on the issues of the last year. Some people say just abolish all the anti-union legislation and we're back to... Well, that, that fails to recognise changes in the world around us that have been here for decades now and, um, and we haven't been able to address them. So even now, despite the fact we had a fantastic manifesto in 2019, things have moved on. So we do need to reflect. We need to make sure that we're protecting people now being forced as I said earlier, to work at home, mm. to take their workplaces into their homes. We've got to deal with fire and rehire. We've got to deal with transfers and global corporations, bigger than states sometimes in their own right, thinking they can just wander around the world and get the best deal that they can and undermine employment rights and protections and trade unions wherever they find them. Yeah, so we, we, have, we have to inspire that debate. That's our job. And we have to do that collectively, and we have to build the alliance that can win it. And if ultimately we can't do that in our party, if we can't do that in our party, given everything that, you know, we, we can, then we have to think seriously about our party and the future of our party. Because you're right, we built Labour. Labour was built with a purpose from the trade union movement 120 years ago. Not to be a silent partner, but to be our voice in, in, mm -hmm. in uh, Westminster and now in our devolved nations, of course. Mm -hmm. And that's our, that's our challenge, is to give it its spark back, to reignite the passion in our party, the values in our party. If, if, we're, not, if we're not offering a vision of hope and opportunity, a very clear program, mm -hmm. a transformative program that recognises the failures of capitalism in so many ways in addressing the issues for working people and all, just ordinary people, really, in mm -hmm. our communities then we'll fail. We'll fail at the ballot box. Just before I ask the final question, tell me, I'm, I'm interested in your own personal background and how that influences not, didn't just influence your, your politics, but your approach to trade unionism in terms of what you'd like trade unionism to be about as if you were General Secretary of Unite. So just yeah. tell me a bit about your backstory and how that's influenced your politics and your approach to the Labour movement in terms of the trade union movement. Yeah, I, had, uh, I owe everything to the union, by the way. I owe my life, probably, <laughs> to the union, if the truth be known. I mean, I, I left school very early on. I was dyslectic. Um, we parted company on mutual terms. Um, and I went to work uh, with my dad, who was self-employed um, at the time. And he cleaned windows and he cleaned cars and he put up fence posts and he painted houses and he did what he did. And I went out and I worked. I worked with him. I got into, I got into a lot of trouble um when i was young and i could have gone in different directions and a lot of my mates went in different directions mm -hmm. i didn't follow them my my life changed when i started work on london buses and i joined our union i joined the transport of general workers union I, I didn't have a qualification to the name and um my union gave me a, a new start in life and that was about a shop steward when I first walked in a Woolworth garage in South East London, putting his arm around me and take, taking me on a journey or starting a journey for me. And it gave me an, an opportunity to find myself. 
And I think that's what trade unions do when you're, you know, when you're, you're in a different world, you're in a different place um, sometimes when you're unemployed and you're struggling and you ain't got anything going for you. And I feel for people that are in that same place now. That's why all this is personal for me. It's what drives me every morning when I get up to build a better world because I've been in a very bad world. And I see a lot of my mates, uh, a lot of them are not with us any longer, unfortunately, for drugs and and for many other reasons as well. Um, but they died far too early and I don't, and that's painful for me. I lost my own brother um, very early on. That's painful for me. And I just think, um, you know, the union gave me an opportunity not just to find myself, but to find a, a voice, but to be who I could be. Um, it freed me up to be who I could be. It took me out of my community. It put me back into education. I ended up without a, a single qualification to the name, not even a CSE, to having a master's degree in industrial relations through my union. My union sponsored me to go and do that. And I did it distance learning. Um, just as we had our first kid, actually, I've got three kids, but just as we had our first kid, I decided to go off and do a distance learning course. And it was the union that sponsored me to do that, that encouraged me to do that, that put its arm around me, its collective arm around me and said, you can be better than this, you can do this. You deserve more than this. And that's, that's the way that I take my mm -hmm. trade unionism into workplaces when I meet people now. We deserve better. As a class, we deserve better. As working people, we deserve better. As a, as communities, we deserve better. But we're never going to get better unless we fight for it, unless we organise for it, unless we win it. It's the whole history of social progress is one of struggle. And that was my struggle, becoming a shop steward. You know, at 19, I joined London Bustles. Becoming a shop steward opened up my world to trade union education, to meeting other people in different walks of life that were equally new shop stewards <laughs> that inspired me. I met people around me that inspired me, that motivated me to do something better with myself, that encouraged me to do that, that em empowered me really to do that. And that, and the union did change my life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely uh, changed my life. I always say the union probably saved my life. And I've been very proud to have tried to put that back into our movement. Every position that I've held in our union, uh, just as an ordinary member, being a shop steward, um, through to being an officer, national now assistant general secretary. When I meet people that are in a bad way, and we've got millions of people in a very bad way now, I want to inspire them to step up and stand up and organise collectively to achieve something that they could never dream of on their own. Mm -hmm. on their own and that's what we do as a trade union movement we do that at work of course but as a trade union we take that outside of our workplaces i'm very proud of what unite does our community membership scheme our campaigns in our communities giving a collective voice to those that are not in paid work inside our union like the mm -hmm. old unemployed workers unions of the 1930s we do that in our union we give people that are often incredibly vulnerable on their own in very desperate situations an opportunity to come together to be to build something that's better than they could ever achieve on their own and that gives them the confidence to step back into wider society very often to be better than they are i i, I don't know how to capture that um but i spend my life just driven by mm -hmm. that by a desire to improve the lives both at work and in a wider field in our communities and in society to improve them to demand and win what we deserve just too quick there's what one question I, I forgot which i do need to ask you but just a just a quick answer to this one it's a, it's about the threat of fascism in the far right yeah uh which is a, a menace of have my own encounters with the far right um <laughs> tell me tell me about your anti-fascism and how unite would be an active anti-fascist union under your leadership I've spent most of my, I'd say, adult life, but before I was an adult, probably, um, fighting fascism. I was suspended for school for organising what was it, in them days, in the 70s, what we call School Kids Against the Nazis, SCAN. And we had a branch of it. And um, I went off with a load of mates to fight the fascists in Lewisham in 1977. And, um, and we got attacked by the police. And that was my first exposure, really, as a 15-year-old. It was my first exposure to the police on horseback 
charging not the fascists that wanted to march through Lewisham, charging the protesters that wanted to stop fascists marching through Lewisham. And then they then diverted them off and allowed them to have their protests wherever they wanted to have it. And that was my first experience, really. I'd had many little experiences before that, but that was my first sort of big collective experience. And the year after that, I was on the Rock Against Racism world and everything that took us to Victoria Park and that whole anti-Nazi league era and just the the you know, the fight against the far right. And in them days, you could see the far right. <laughs> you knew who they were. They were often standing on street corners, you know, uh, in their groups and they were attacking you. And it was really vicious. You know, right through my life, I've um, I fought that. And I'm very proud um, to have fought that. And I'm very proud now, by the way, to lead our unity over division strategy, uh, which allows that to take that fight off of the streets, if you like, and into our workplaces and back into our communities. Not that we don't fight fascists on that. There can be no safe place for a fascist. You know that more than anyone I know. And you've been the, the, uh, the victim of the far right and fascism for many a year. And, uh, and I've been there with you when you've been uh, under attack, you know. So, you know, we, ha we have to fight the fascists on the streets if we have to fight the fascists on the streets. That's the reality of it. But equally, we have to win the hearts and minds and we have to win the battle of ideas in our workplaces, in our communities, on the bus, down the pub, uh, in our clubs, in our homes. Hmm. Wherever that narrative of hate and division raises its ugly head, we have to, we have to address it. And not just silence people, because you, you've got to get inside the mind that takes them on that journey to want to do harm or want to speak out in a hateful way against somebody else. So you have to challenge in it in a different way. And that's why our unity over division strategy does. It enables mm. people, it empowers people and gives them the confidence to have them difficult conversations and steer them and try and recognise that people are where they are based on their life experiences very often. And we have to take that life experience and not rubbish it or belittle it, but take it and try to channel it and take them on a new phase of their life, a new mm -hmm. journey. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do in Unity Over Division. And I'm incredibly proud of that. And we're in workplaces up and down our nations, across our union and outside of our union internationally now, sharing it with colleagues in Germany, where we've got a shared employer, BMW being one right now where the far right in Germany are trying to organise in auto plants. And we're using the experiences we've got from our programme, Unity Over Division, in mm -hmm. Germany with our sister union, IG Mattel. Mm -hmm. So I get, I'm astonished when I read some of this um, stuff uh, on social media about I'm some, you said about I'm some right winger, you know, or I'm some uh, apologist for the fascists or something. I've never been an apologist for the fascists. I've never been an apologist for the fascists. But... You know, taking people on a journey that are in that group right now is the right way, I think, to go about it. Them hard-nosed fascists, you've got to deal with them in a traditional way. But those that surround them, often looking for answers that are not coming from our party, that are not coming from our movement, but are easy answers thrown into them from the far right. You know, we need to take those people and we need to channel them and we need to answer their questions and give them the hope that they need to channel their energy into something different. And I think we can do that. Finally, if I was a betting man, I would say, as things stand, Coyne, Gerard Coyne, the right-wing candidate, is likely to be the next General Secretary of Unite. And the reason I say that is, in 2017, Len McCluskey, the incumbent, got a whopping big majority in nominations, way beyond what Coyne got. When the actual vote took place, it was a very, very slim margin, and Coyne nearly won that election. This time round, if there are three left candidates standing, and we saw what happened in unison with two left candidates standing, they won a majority of the votes, but it's first past the post. Doesn't matter. Coyne could win with 30% of the vote. That's entirely plausible. Even if the, the left candidates get 70% together, irrelevant. That's how the system works. So I think as things stand, he is likely to become the next yeah. General Secretary. So I suppose the question I'd ask, pose to you is, very simply, why do you have the strongest democratic case? Because I know a lot of people be thinking, well, actually, shouldn't the members decide? Of course, in an ideal world, but I'm sorry, the electoral system of Unite sucks. So in given the political reality and what's at stake, and it, I don't think people watching this or listening to this, many of them realise 
we are on the cusp, from a left-wing perspective, of complete calamity, an existential moment. We are literally just marching off a cliff at the moment. And I think the left will struggle in this country to recover for a generation or more if this goes badly wrong. So why do you have the strongest democratic case if there is to be one single left candidate to go forward? Well, your, your analysis I would uh, concur with. Um, if we can't improve the turnout to the point where our members speak out against that direction of travel that you just laid out there, then uh, I'm, I'm in the same place that you're at, that it's going to be incredibly difficult to see an outcome um, that doesn't see the right taking control of this union with three left candidates. So we are in discussion about whether or not we can reach an agreement between us. I mean, I am the, the candidate that I would, I'm going to argue, aren't I, as the mandate from our members um, to stand, to be the candidate. I won the United Left Austins um, a year ago. Uh, I've won the most amount of nominations now, by a long way, by the way. I've got 526 nominations. My closest rival has 300 and um, nominations. So by a long way, by a long way. I've also got the breadth of support across every sector and region and group uh, within our union. We've got fantastic teams across our union. Our manifesto, it's not about, e people say this is about egos. It's not really about... Of course, of course, there's some ego in this, but the reality is this is also about a vision for our union and, and the role that our union plays in our movement, our trade union movement, also our wider labour movement, but equally across our communities as well and the alliances that we build. All of this is at risk, by the way. You're, you're spot on. You, your analysis of what is at risk uh, is spot on, Owen. So the reality for us is we have to come together in order to minimise the opportunity for the right uh, to take control of our union. And I'll continue to do that until the last opportunity passes us by. But the reality is, you know, if we end up in a position where that's just not the case, and we've got four people on this ballot, three left wingers and one on the right, well, it will be a failure for all of us, by the way. But the reality will be that we will have to inspire and motivate ordinary members of this union to step up to the plate and participate in an election that perhaps they wouldn't traditionally have, uh, have participated in, to build a campaign that, you know, it does inspire people, gives them hope, gives them real opportunity for change and gives them, you know, the strength of their union industrially and in a wider sense to address the very real issues that they've got. And that's without going into a programme and everything else. That's what we've got to do. And that's what I'll do. So I don't say that Gerard Coyne is the favourite um, in this, because I think that, you know, at the end of the day, we'll reach an arrangement between us that enables us to defeat that. But if that's not possible, I still think that we'll win our election when then ballot papers, the last of those ballot papers come in at the end of August uh, this year. Well, I certainly hope so, because I think this is a profoundly frightening moment uh, for anyone vaguely of the left, because yeah. if he wins, if people think there's going to be any Labour Party, any democracy in the Labour Party, uh, any chance of getting a left candidate on the ballot ever again, any chance of defending the policies that so many millions of people support and that this country so desperately needs, any all the ecosystem that Unite supported, the People's Assembly against austerity, the class think tank groups like UK and Cop UK again and Cop, yeah I was gonna say yeah received Absolutely. all that support uh you know being there, the climate justice movement the pot the plug is going to get pulled and a lot of what people have taken for granted in this country of there being a viable strong left that would die and I don't think people have realized but and internally as well organizing of course, uh, our leverage exactly. strategies, our support for our combines and our shop stewards movement, the education of our shop stewards. These are all things I've lived under, I've worked under right wing general secretaries in the past. And believe me, they have a plan. <laughs> they have a plan and it doesn't involve our stewards empowering themselves and our members to fight back very often. And that's where we can be proud of what we've done with our union over the past 10 years. But that's what's at risk, spot on. I mean, that's what's at risk right now. All of the broader stuff, absolutely but equally inside our union 
And that's the message we've got to get out inside Unite, not in the Twitter sphere somewhere, inside Unite. This is your union, your union. You've got to empower your shop stewards to defend you. We've got to stand up collectively uh, in order to meet the challenges, but also the opportunities that face us as we come through COVID and climate emergency and everything else. We've got a plan and a vision uh, and a real proper strategy, strategy and program to do that. And we've got to inspire our people to be part of it and come with us on the journey. That means increasing the turnout, having them discussions in every workplace, in every pub, in every home, <laughs> you know, everywhere, as I always say, we're working people who are having discussions. We've got to inspire them to take part in this election and vote for our candidates. Yeah. Well, Steve, really appreciate you joining me. Fingers crossed and, uh, and take care. Yeah, and no, I appreciate being with you, mate. Fantastic. Cheers.